Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. I'm really excited about this. Uh, many of you know that I have uh, mentioned and taught uh, the work of Charles M. Stang, uh, particularly his book, The Divine Double, um, uh, played an important role in a couple of episodes of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I went to uh, the symposium on embodiment in uh, Tuscany in um, July, and Charles was there. Uh, which was uh, to my great delight. Um, we got to have several conversations and interact. And uh, I think it's fair to say we've hit it off and we see a tremendous convergence uh, between our, our work. Um, so welcome, Charles. It's such a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, what, what your work is and how you and I met and how the, you know, how your work and uh, mine resonate together. Great. Well, first of all, John, thank you so much for the invitation to be uh, with you today. Uh, and I do hope that this is just a continuation of the next installment in a long conversation we have. Um, yeah. And let me echo that meeting you at that symposium was a real highlight. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, this is this is this is very exciting to me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for those uh, who are joining, uh, let me just introduce myself briefly. My name is Charles Stang. I teach at Harvard Divinity School. I've been on the faculty here since 2008. My official title is Professor of Early Christian Thought. Um, sometimes at other universities that goes under the name of patristics, study of the so-called church fathers. Um, in my own work, uh, I extend that quite a bit beyond uh, the the church fathers and I study the religion and philosophy in the ancient Mediterranean world. And that kind of wide net is reflected in the book that uh, John held up uh, called Our Divine and Double, which was published in 2016. There it is again. <laughs> um, so here at Harvard Divinity School, I, I teach a range of courses, mostly in the ancient world, but occasionally I indulge my interests in modern philosophy and thought and offer something uh, more current uh, such as uh, two years ago, I taught a seminar the whole year on Henri Corbin, the uh, mm. French uh, thinker, and that I've come to know that John also has an interest in. So we can we can circle back to that shared interest. Mm. Mm. About five years ago, um, I took on a new role here at the Divinity School, and I've been directing what's called the Center for the Study of World Religions, which is a uh, under the aegis of the Divinity School, but is um, in part an intentional community and part a programming hub for the school, the university, and beyond. And um, that's been a great joy, uh, a great privilege to come out of the mine shaft of my own <laughs> subfield interests and really try to host uh, conversations um, in the wider study of religion, but also conversations that cross the study of religion with adjacent fields like yours, John, like psychology and cognitive science. And in just this past, we're in the second year of, an, of a new initiative at the center called Transcendence and Transformation. And that's in, that initiative is, is, is really premised on the idea that the study of religion has, has really not entirely lost its way, but that it's not attending <laughs> to some very important uh, uh, features of um, of existence uh, that and that that both students and literate public are eager to hear about, um, having to do with uh, transcending our our accustomed states of mind, being embodiment, consciousness, and the kinds of transformation that those. That, that transcendence affords so we're really trying to dig into that and i can say more about that that initiative and all the various parts of it um if you wish but maybe in the interest of time i'll move on to how you and i met john just to again reiterate what you've already said um uh, you and i met at a, um, a symposium on the topic of embodiment a huge topic of course but it had a kind of uh um a distinctive theme. It was really around theorizing and practicing uh, the subtle body. And mm -hmm. the subtle body is this notion that beyond the kind of obvious physical and body that we have, there are other bodies and anatomies 
that interpenetrate this one and that we can engage, uh, learn about, engage, and that are also powerful tools for our transcendence and transformation. Um, and and uh, those are found in the East and the West, in antiquity and modernity, they're everywhere. And uh, that symposium where we met was a first attempt to map some of that out and there will be other attempts to map it out and i suspect you and i will be collaborating on that yes. uh, down the road um so uh i have only recently come to know uh, of um of your work john and i've been pretty excited by it because there's a number of points of connection even though i'm reading in a field that's you know fairly um, alien to me. I don't read in psychology and cognitive science regularly, so I also have to get used to the. Um, <laughs> the I got. I got to get used to the, the 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 you know the the style, so to speak, yeah, the yeah. style of thinking and the style of writing. Uh, but thankfully, you're a very clear writer, so I think I have been able to follow most of your arguments, um, and I find them very much um, in alignment with my own. In arguments. And I'll just name you, and maybe we can come back to these to another occasion. But I'm very interested in your account of flow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in both the idea of intuition and action cascades you mentioned yeah. uh, in a few papers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm not new to the, I, I'm new to the, the conversation about flow, not entirely new. I've read some of it, but I'm quite interested in whether and how flow states should be considered um in the broader archive of what we call mystical or ecstatic mm -hmm. states yes. experiences uh so that's one topic um i'm really interested in your approach to wisdom and trying to take the ancient philosophical account of wisdom seriously but then translate it into um a, a, a new idiom uh I'm very interested in exploring your thoughts on wisdom further. Um, and and then very specific thing that uh, piques my interest is what you've written about the uh, moreover and uh, some of the amazing, shall we say, imaginal techniques used by the engineers and the scientists yeah. to yes. direct that rover um, and, and achieve a kind of presence on mars through the rover that was really thrilling to read so those are just a few things um uh and maybe with that i'll just pause and see where you want to begin the conversation that's fantastic um uh the the, the papers that charles referred to were written with my good friend and colleague uh dan chiappi um but there's the th there's three papers on the the mars rovers um i i think i'd like to start with um that point that I found uh, pleasantly provocative, uh, where you uh, you were being very very discreet and po uh, and politic and polite about how the study of religion has lost its way. Um, <laughs> well, you, you, I, I think that that is um, part of and to some degree symptomatic of the general meaning crisis, which is um, the sort of dehoming and displacement of religion uh because that's i think what secularism has done i don't think it has eradicated religion by any means i think it's just dis displaced it and like when some of my work you look at the nuns the nones who have no mm -hmm. like, they're by and large not sort of uh scientific materialistic atheists there um they are they, they describe themselves with this um I, maybe intentionally so but nevertheless vague i'm spiritual but not religious and what does this mean? And that's what I mean about it hasn't gone away. It's been displaced and dehomed and made very mm -hmm. sort of individualistic and autodidactic. Um, and then the study of the, the perhaps the academic study of religion is in some sense, you know, um, complicit with that or, or, or in resonance with it. Um, and you said that in that sense, we we have lost. I I am only paraphrasing you. It's not verbatim, but something like we've lost some important dimensions of the religious endeavor, the religious experience that have to do with transcendence and transformation. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, if we could zero in on that first, because sure, uh, I, uh, and, and and the initiative is directed towards correcting that to some degree. I understand. Um, That's right. So, uh, a, a little bit about what what did can you unpack a little bit about losing. Sure. It's way. 
Yeah. Okay, well, I was trying to be politic, but I'm, now we'll be more provocative. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the truth of the matter is that I feel this is an issue that afflicts more than the study of religion, that this is a yeah. problem in the humanities writ large. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the humanities, and then I'll speak about religion as a specific case of it. So um, I generally feel as if the humanities are suffering from an impoverished uh, understanding of the human being, mm. ironically. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the human <laughs> is rather small and flat in mm. most humanities. Uh, let me make appeal to that adjective flat and talk about this late 19th century novel, Flatland. Have you ever heard of Flatland, John? I've read it. I've read Flatland. Yeah, good. Okay, so you know, very briefly, for those who are listening who haven't read it, it's it's a, it's a satire and it's it's a, it's a, an allegory of sorts. And the main character is a square, who literally a square, who lives in a two-dimensional universe. Um, and he has a dream of a sphere. And he tries to make sense of this uh, this dream and tell other squares about this sphere um it doesn't go well for him <laughs> um and he eventually is um, imprisoned and all talk about spheres is uh outlawed mm. and he and and the book flatland is this memoir he writes from prison in hopes that someday squares will once again dream of spheres and and seek them out and so it's uh, obviously an allegory about living in a kind of um uh, almost a, uh, a a kind of self-imposed limited dimension mm -hmm. and uh, a, refu a refusal to acknowledge the ways in which other dimensions might intersect mm -hmm. with uh, ours um so Okay, now back to the humanities. I feel like the human we're in a place right now where the hum humanities to me often feel like flatland humanities. Mm, yeah. um, and I think that, you know, things like, there are really important things that are unpacked in the humanities, um, like uh, abuses of power, the ways in which power work in social political uh, systems. Um, uh, race, racism. Um, but I, it feels to me often that these really important critical conversations in the humanities come at the cost of acknowledging the uh, fuller and, and I would, you know, hazard to say sort of transcend, transcendent understanding of human, mm -hmm. that the human has capacities um, that uh, exceed our expectation. And so these sorts of altered states to me are signs of that transcendent humanity breaking through into our flat land. Mm. Now, the study of religion, I feel, is a, you know, the study of religion is, an, is, is a newcomer onto the field of the humanities in, in universities. Obviously, theology isn't, but the study of religion is very new. Mm -hmm. And I think it suffers from something of an inferiority complex. It's trying to fit in with the humanities. Uh -huh. And in order to fit in, it's sort of trying to mimic the other humanities. And I think that's just come at a great cost. I don't think, I think we have, I think the humanities in general have been accomplices in their own obsolescence. I think mm -hmm. we all know the humanities are kind of in a decline. And I think that um, the study of religion is, is a kind of case study in that. Because for me, if there's anything that we can meaningfully constellate under that category of religion, which is, you know, a contested Western category under which we group all kinds of things. But if it has any meaning to me, it's a very expanded uh, anthropology, ontology, and epistemology. This, mm -hmm. is a, this is an expansive understanding of what the human is, what are the world or worlds in which we are, um, in which we are living, and how can we know those worlds, mm -hmm. uh, engage those worlds. Um, so that, 
that is sort of the a bit of the background to what I'm calling the transcend the, the calling transcendence and transformation. Um, and you know, I think more specifically, what we're really looking to highlight are these traditions across the globe throughout history that insist that there are greater capacities in the human that can be named, acknowledged, pursued, and and consequently not just individuals but groups, societies, uh, and and maybe even the more than human world can be transformed. Um, so, so that's what we're trying to lean into. And that maybe humans aren't always the only agents in this trans <laughs> in this transformation. So um, we've been like just a, a very concrete example. We have a reading group right now um, here at the center focused on what we're calling plant consciousness. So there's an explosion of interest in this question of whether and how plants can be said to sense, think, communicate. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're and, and, and scientists, philosophers, and botanists are all, well, I shouldn't say botanists, mm -hmm. if they're not scientists. Mm -hmm. Scientists, philosophers, and others are sort of taking this question um, up from different angles. Right. Okay, so the, uh, what you just said and, and before that, it sounds like you're not only talking about a human capacity for transcendence and then some kind of profound change in, in consciousness, cognition, character, and transformation. Yeah. Um, what I mean is you're, you're invoking transformation in a, a profound sense, not a trivial sense. Um, I, I, so when you put those together, it also sounds like there is a complementary thesis that transcendence and transformation disclose truths, disclosed dimensions, levels, aspects of reality that are otherwise inaccessible to us without those transformations and transcendence is that correct i mean that's that that's what's correct. going on that's what's going on in the invocation of flatland because the other people can't they're the the other well, the other squares sorry other people the other squares can't get their mindset can't allow them to accommodate uh to the possibility of the third dimension in, in any important way um that's so correct. it sounds to me then that although your criticism is located in the humanities to some degree it would maybe necessarily entail um a critique of the standard version of the scientific worldview as well and so there, right. so there the, the, crit the critique also uh, extends into a, a deeper critique of um the current ver current version of uh, the scientific worldview. Now, I know you're not anti-scientific. I know you uh, you involve with, you discuss with uh, scientists, but um, can you say a little bit more about this? This is this is, of course, well, both poles of these, both the uh, anthropological and let's call it the ontological, are very very tricky because our culture kind of bifurcates around this. It either says, you know, completely the unchallenged scientific worldview, even though it's presently kind of incoherent and can't actually ground the practice of science itself and all kinds mm -hmm. of problems I point out. Know, but you get a kind of, let's say, a reductionist interpretation of the findings yeah. of science. Yeah. And, or you or you get this flip and you get this decadent romantic where just every sort of woo idea is considered to be, you know, something that we should take up and that we should, and all that matters is how you feel about it and, and, and other things like that. And, and you rightly smiled around that. And, and so, cause you're, you, and so for me, in a lot of my work, I, I, you know, I'm trying to steer between this Scylla and Charybdis. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you are also feeling that and any sense you have about how you're navigating that. Yeah. I feel it very acutely, John. And I, I can, I can sort of, I'll circle back to science in a minute, but for for the moment, let me just um, tell you a little story that I think will illuminate this, yeah. which is, I think it was maybe five, six years ago, seven years ago, um, I, I kind of, a, a question occurred to me that I couldn't, I couldn't answer for myself. I, uh, and that was this, I, I was deep in the study of the ancient world where I'm regularly taking very seriously 
people's extraordinary experiences, right. experiences of encounters with the divine, experiences of um, you know super normal capacities, yeah. um, encounters with other entities, and as a as a his, a historian, I'm, I mean I'm not really a historian, but I work with historical materials, but. Yeah. I, you know, I work with these materials and I tr try and take them very seriously and, and not reduce these accounts to fancy or, you know, um, some other material conditions. So I was doing this sort of um, what I thought was, and I still think was rigorous and responsible treatment of these ancient testimonies. But then I asked myself, why do I not take any of the contemporary <laughs> Right. extraordinary experience seriously what is the principle by which i take something in the past seriously ah. but i but i don't take it in the present seriously and that you know opened the floodgates in a sense because of course our world is full of people mm. um and, and and including ourselves we often have these experiences that yes. we don't know what to do with right we don't and we don't permit ourselves to engage them with the same kind of rigor that we we do um our scholarly work so i the the floodgates open and i thought okay i need to figure out how to sift through and wow. discern and engage the the, the contemporary and I, that there's no i don't have a i don't have an easy how-to guide for that um but it has involved a lot of and so a you, lot of you dropped for a sec a lot of which a lot of listening. Ah, yeah. List, you know, listening to people um, and suppressing the immediate urge to dismiss, mm. um, and and sort of carrying with the the uncomfortable and the weird. Um, I mean, I haven't gone as far as my good friend and colleague Jeff Kreipal at Rice University. I mean, Jeff has really made a career out of taking people's extraordinary experiences in the present very seriously and trying to think about reality in and through those experiences. Yeah. Um, I've done a, a, you know, just a tiny version of that, but what it means, sorry, to circle back, what it means is I, I think, um, although we miss stuff as woo, I think uh, it, it's, it's incumbent upon us to figure out what, what are the criteria area by which we want to dismiss certain extraordinary claims yes. and yet admit others okay in terms of science john i would say this i you know i'm not a historian of science nor a philosopher of science obviously a person in this world who knows that we're in a scientism you know we're in we're, we are in a kind of a world of scientism it's so it seems at least yes. um uh at least in in our um quote unquote elite culture and what I mean by that is uh, um, science has the presumed authority to explain just about everything. Mm -hmm. And, but there, I feel like there's a tendency as I feel as if the, the reigning scientism of the day is largely a kind of reductive materialism. Yes. Which says something like all phenomena can eventually be explained by appeal to material conditions. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, within science's own account of matter and material conditions there's wild scaling speculation and plurality yes. and they don't all line yes. up yes um so yes. there there the, to me it feels like and and i find actually some of them i i find some scientific writers they're popular scientific writers but sort of thrilling because they're t they, they're telling us about the frontiers of thinking in science which are very imaginative very fun, very curious, but the, all those accounts don't line up. And yep. so when somebody w tells me that authority should rest in a reduction to science, whatever science's explanation is, I think, well, which explanation and on what order of reality yes. um, should I be yep. um, deferring for authority? It doesn't seem at all clear. Uh, it seems a sort of internal and internally incoherent scientism, I suppose. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm not going to repeat arguments that I've made and other people have, uh, uh, in other contexts, other people, and many of you have heard it, many arguments as to why I think uh, a reductive 
uh, uh, materialism, uh, um, uh, which you're equating with scientism, which I think is fine to do, um, why I think it's incoherent, why it's a performative contradiction, why it has all kinds of profound problems. Uh, and I, I reject that. Um, but I like the move you made, which was really interesting about the non-homogeneity uh, I don't know what to call it. That's not dismissive, but let, like, let's say the, the romantic over here. I, I'm, I'm trying to choose a neutral term, but it, that is some sense anti anti uh, anti science in some sense. And then the non homogeneity there, and also the non homogeneity in in science. Um, mm -hmm. I think first of all, I wanted to note that I hadn't put that out as an explicit thought. And pairing them together is a really interesting thing to map onto the sort of Scylla and Charybdis problem because it's not like Scylla and Charybdis are clearly marked for you, uh, <laughs> right? Right, if right. I understand you correctly. And so uh, I have been trying to do work at a reciprocal reconstruction between spirituality, maybe that's the better term for over here, I don't know, and science that now that I think about it, I think it's fair to say is very, uh, tries to appropriate that non-homogeneity because the non-homogeneity means that reciprocal reconstruction is actually possible. If they were completely homo homo homogeneous and locked, getting them to reconstruct each other in some sort of dialogical fashion be would be very difficult. But if they're non-homogeneous and they're already dynamically in flux, then getting them to reciprocally reconstruct becomes a much more, much more possible um, thing to do. Does it, does that land with you? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And I hadn't, I hadn't sort of put those two together, but that's very, that's very good. Uh, so thank you for that. They, yeah. The reciprocal reconstruction is a, a really afforded by the non-homogeneity of the two things, the two poles. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. So then, and let's take that you're nodding and you, you said it landed. Let's take that as granted. Then, um, the issue is, and, and we can take time on this uh, because it's not a question about science, but it's this issue is how does one be responsibly rational in this? Where I don't mean rational to be logical. I mean, how does how do how do we deal with the perennial problems of self-deception uh, within human mm -hmm. observation, cognition, speculation, mm -hmm. et cetera? Um, we, right. We can, to some degree, avail ourselves of some of the techniques from science for overcoming self-deception we can to some degree avail ourselves from with some of the um, imaginal and transformative practices that take us out of the distortions of egocentrism or a flat ontology i yeah. but i want to give the question to you i want i'll open it up to you what what mm -hmm. like you know what are your thoughts about what does it mean to be uh like, let's say almost socratically or platonically rational as yeah. we yeah. as we attempt to do this you know, steering or reciprocal reconstruction. Does the question make sense to you? Yes, it does. Yeah. Well, or uh, it makes sense to me. And and in my, my, the answer I'll give, will tell you whether I heard it right. Okay. <laughs> but um, uh, so I think a lot about this in the context of longstanding communities of practice mm. that afford or elicit extraordinary experiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking here, this is no doubt partly due to my um, the training and background uh, in the monasticism, uh, Christian monasticism. Mm -hmm. Although I would invite you, because I know you work in, in um, work and practice in some Eastern traditions to, to complement this. Mm -hmm. But there are in monastic practice has from its very beginnings in Egypt in the fourth century, occasioned in these men and women, these monks and nuns, extraordinary experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, extraordinary experiences of the angelic, the demonic, the divine, and the more than human. Mm -hmm. uh, visions, dreams, precognition, um, all variety of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. None of those experiences are simply taken literally and granted truth without mm -hmm. being over generations sifted and scoured <laughs> almost. There is in these communities a sense that of course self-delusion is uh, um, 
not only possible, but is a persistent threat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the delusion might not be even just coming from the self. There might be other forces mm -hmm. that are trying to delude you. So obviously in, in a Christian framework, that's going to be um, somewhat uh, Satan and his, and his minions, the demons. Uh, but, but I think the, 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 the point I want to pull out of it, and it's a point actually beautifully made by Michael Murphy in the future of the body too, is that these are communities that actually have developed practices and mm -hmm. protocols for sifting through experiences. Um, and I know that such things exist in Buddhist communities yes. as well, where there are yeah. also yeah. extraordinary yeah. visions and experiences had, but there is also a cultivation of not so much, I don't want to say a distrust, but a, but a critical distance mm -hmm. on one's own experiences and the experiences of others. I think that kind of critical distance and that kind of sifting warrants the name rational Mm -hmm. in a way yes there's a kind yes. of rationality in that yes. yes that i think we would we would do well to recover um or at least um we, we would do well to resource and retrieve and maybe reimagine for the communities that we're in now which as you said are uh different than you know we're not in these um we're not in a position where these traditions are quite so cleanly yep. defined one from another these spiritual but not religious uh, folks kind of move in and out of each, uh, in and out of communities. So yeah. how can we adapt that kind of rationale discernment yeah. to a new context? Excellent. Excellent. Which I think is part of the, the challenge of responding to the meaning crisis, what you just said. Um, well, I want to, first of all, I think it would be buttressing your point about the rationality uh, that, uh, the, you, we have the power of a collective intelligence of distributed cognition, both synchronically within a community and then diachronically across generations. It's very powerful and it's doing this sifting very much so. And then I would put to you that that sifting is not, uh, it, it, it may not look like rationality to us because of the propositional tyranny, because we have we have reduced knowing to nice. propositional tyranny. We've lost the procedural knowing. We've lost the perspectival. We've lost the participatory dimensions of rationality, which probably are, in fact, I would argue, as important and in some cases more important than propositional inferential rationality. And so, therefore, both should we should we should acknowledge what you've said that this collective intelligence within distributed cognition greatly expanded like i said and and, uh, and that that it's also dealing with dimensions of rationality that is, that escape our kind of flatland understanding of rationality right now so we have to both acknowledge the the depth and the breadth of it but also the fact that it is opening up domains and dimensions of rationality that we are, are kind of blind to right now um so i first want to put that out and see how that lands with you as a proposal. yeah yeah um, so er earlier when I was complaining about a sort of a, a diminished anthropology, ontology, and epistemology that uh, to me is sort of afflicting the study of religion and the other humanities, if I would just focus on that last one, a kind of diminished epistemology, uh, what you've just said lands very, mm -hmm. lands very uh, poignantly for me, which is I feel as if, uh, as you've said, there's a kind of propositional tyranny that has, has uh, flattened rationality. Yes. And what are the what so under the under the banner of an expanded epistemology, how we know, um, I would want to say I would want to include um, these efforts to expand rationality. What are the modes of reasoning that we we might not, as you said, recognize anymore as reasoning, yes. but are deeply deep forms of reasoning? Yes. Uh, what do they look? I mean, can we can we recover these and 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 um, and redeploy them meaningfully today? Yeah, I, I for me, I, I I think of that as a sapiential notion of rationality, yes. um, and, and 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 therefore it ties to the earlier claim that therefore there are ways of disclosing the world, and in that sense, knowing that require transformation and transcendence. That yep. that and that that. Like we have, we have lost 
let, let me call it a contemplative axis of ratio and we reduced it to the computational and then it has been further reduced as you said within the humanities to a kind of communicative uh thing and so we've got this uh reduction now for me um when when you when you sort of I mean, you start. You're going to start. I think I would propose you're going to start moving towards something like a virtue epistemology, because virtues mm -hmm. combine propositional beliefs with procedural skills, with you know, with perspectival, you know, states of consciousness, states of mind, mm -hmm. with participatory character traits, and that we understand that. And the fact that virtue epistemology and virtue ethics are taking off right now, I don't think is a coincidence either. I think is an attempt to try and get back to. Can we broaden our responsiveness to normativity uh, to include uh, beyond uh, our propositional commitment to sort of logical coherence uh, and empirical adequacy? Um, so I think that's an, an important thing to note. And then I, I want to, but I want to now bring it back to engaging with it because for me, like the thing that, well, like when I'm reading Plotinus, I, and, and I aspire to being like Plotinus as a writer and a thinker, just like I aspire, I aspire to being like so Socrates as a per person. Those are my two big aspirational divine doubles. We'll, we can perhaps comes back to that in a minute. Because uh, I, I do want to make a connection Perfect. between rationality and aspiration to get, and then get into the divine double. But before I say, okay. say that, like when I'm reading Plotinus, it, it took me a while to realize this, and then I was able to do the same thing with Spinoza, who seems like the most computational of all philosophers, but in fact, he's not. He's ultimately talking about love which is re and participation in God. And I think Claire Carlyle's book on Spinoza's religion is a masterpiece of, about that, just fantastic book. Um, but when I'm reading Plotinus, it's like I'm simultaneously getting an argument in the traditional sort of premises leading to a conclusion, and I'm going through an imaginal spiritual exercise at the same time. Like yeah. and, and, and the text doesn't feel cacophonous or disjointed. And then I'm thinking that like that, like I want to be, I want to be able to take the stance that affords me having that kind of rationality. Do you, do you know what I mean? Does that, does, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so that, that to me, uh, it, 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 it is, uh, 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 something exemplary. And I think the, the whole Neoplatonic tradition, um, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there's variations in it, and I, but there, 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 there's very often that concerted effort to make something simultaneously an argument and a spiritual exercise. I think Proclus's Elements of Theology is doing the same thing. Um, Absolutely. In, yeah, in a deep way. And, 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 and then part of what I'm saying is that we have often, and this is a way of extending Pierre Hadot, We've often misread these ancient texts, and especially Plato, because what we do is we lift the argument out oh, out of all of the spiritual exercise. Now, thankfully, third wave Platonism it, it is now correcting that. You know, the work of Gonzalez and Highland and uh, uh, Kirkland and, and Ruchik and all of those people that I'm I, I'm doing a lot of work with, um, like I'm making use of their work. Um, but it's like. I'm trying to say that there, there's kind of this recursive insidious thing that the flat landing actually prevents us. It, it, it makes us misread the texts that might exemplify for us the kind of rationality we need to get out of the flatland. I know that was a long argument, but do you? I was oh, no, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. When I was an undergrad here, um, I, uh, here at Harvard, I was a philosophy major and one of the great philosophers uh, in the department then was Hillary Putnam. Of course. And I was sitting in on a class. Yeah. And and and, and Putnam told this story of, um, it was in a topic called, I mean, a class called Topics in Epistemology, I think. Putnam told a story of being a young uh, assistant professor and being asked history of philosophy. So he had to teach Plato. And what did he do? Except he would do exactly what you described. He, he admitted this. Yeah. He said, I extract an argument from dialogue. I would render it into, um, you know, propositional form. I would try to, you know, essentially paraphrase it into the form I knew how to uh, uh, manipulate. 
And many of the arguments were poor arguments, was his, yeah, yeah, <laughs> was his yeah, 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 conclusion. Yeah. They, do, they don't work. And, and he felt like, well, what am I supposed to do? What is it to teach the history of philosophy while I'm teaching these set of lousy arguments? And, um, and it, he was narrating this because you know, he was quite advanced in age at that time. He was, he, he was, it was a lament in a way. It was a real yeah. lament. He was, because he had come to realize that the value of Plato was not in the extracted the extraction of the arguments and Plato, of course, knew at times that I don't know that he knew this for every one of the yeah. argument, the, the quote unquote faulty arguments that Socrates deploys. But Socrates deploys some faulty arguments, but yes. that may be for pedagogical, profound pedagogical purposes. Yes, uh, for those who are around him and or for the reader to know. Wait, why is it that why is it that Socrates in the first book of the Republic? dismisses Thrasymachus with myth that's fallacious. Thrasymachus's argument is not actually undone. That's yeah. an important thing to realize about what the drama of yes. uh, the Republic is. Um, so that's just an example of that kind of, yeah. uh, what again, what, I, what you called propositional tyranny hanging yeah. out. And there's a, a immensely learned and in, in some ways wise philosopher, Hilary Putnam, very late in life, reflecting on the ways in which his own had done this interpretive violence for generations of students. Exactly, exactly. So the the, and the Socratic example is well placed, and um, uh, because it, 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 I think one of the arguments made by Gonzalez and uh, and all of, uh, and all of these people um, is that Plato is putting an emphasis on transformation over uh, propositional coherence um, and and that you have to see everything that's going on, the multidimensional thing. Um, and it's very much, like I said, and, and it, for me, um, you get something very similar in Plotinus because you're reading argument, but you're doing this spiritual exercise at the same time. And, and they were crafting that. You can see them crafting that across centuries, trying to get better and better, right? Um, so, if you if we if we agree with that and right we put the transformative and the 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 participation in transcendence back into a proper place within rationality, I think we get we bump into Agnes Callard's work, uh, which is the work that I then uh, sort of tried to map onto uh, your divine double. It goes something like this. She, she follows on the work of L.A. Paul um, that when we're actually going through transcendence or transformation, uh, we face the fact that we are symmetrically, uh, perspectively, and uh, participatorily ignorant. Now, uh, L.A. Paul gives a, the famous thought experiment. Your friends come to you and offer that they can turn you, they give you just indubitable evidence that they can turn you into a vampire. Should you do it? And, and the problem is, although you have all kinds of propositional facts about vampires, and although you have some, maybe some skills, maybe you lurk well in dark alleys or something, uh, um, you're, you're, you don't know what it's like in the Nigelian sense. You don't know what it's like. You don't have, you can't take the perspective landscaping, salience landscaping of a vampire. You don't know what that's like. And, and you don't know who you're going to be because your values and your virtues are going to be all altered by the transformation. So you're both perspectively and participatorily ignorant. And then she says that ignorance means you can't infer your way through it. You can't infer your way through it because you don't, you can't assign the probabilities or the utilities because you're ignorant. And so she mm -hmm. says, so she says, and, and Agnes Callard agrees with her, standard decision theoretic models of rationality come crashing down. Now you might then say, well, who cares? Vampires, right? And then she says, but wait. When you decide to have a child, you're facing exactly the same thing. You don't know what it's like to be a parent until you're one, and your values and everything is going to change. And and, and then and and then she give. Should you enter into the, a romantic relationship with this person? Same problem. Should you leave and move to another career? Same problem. And then she sort of goes. Uh, uh, she stops there, and she just sort of problematizes. Now I have an argument. That I've actually talked to Laurie about, which is, well, I think human beings get around this with this notion of serious play that they engage in. And that's how you see even in intelligent mammalian development, where 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 you can do is you can get to this, okay, have a child. This is what people do. They get a dog. 
right? And then they take pictures with the dog and they give the dog toys and, right? So they get a taste of what it might be like, all right? They step into this liminal place of serious play, what it's like, right? And, and how it might change them, but they're not overcommitted and they can pull out if they want to, right? And so, and you can see, a, and you can see a lot of religion as that kind of important serious play. Therapy is definitely doing that. Uh, we can come back to that in a minute. Uh, but mechanism or process aside, Agnes Callard then comes in and she makes a very powerful argument. Well, what we do is a process of aspiration. Um, and she talks about proleptic rationality. And, and so I'm going to make an argument. She doesn't quite make it as linearly straight as this, but I, I don't think it's unfair. But it goes something like this. Part, what's constitutive of rationality is the aspiration to become more rational. That's a constitutive element of rational. It's because it is an inherently self-corrective process. So if you remove the self-correction from rationality, you're no longer being rational. And so you're aspiring to be something that you're currently not. And then she said, you, you start to bang into this problem that you can't actually infer your, this is great. And, and, and you can't actually infer your way into being more rational. Instead, what you do is you have to bind yourself to a future self, um, and and there's empirical work. I, I, because, so here's how the ar argument goes. Aspiration is a constitutive feature of rationality, but aspiration is not an inherently um, inferential process because it involves transformative experience. It bumps up into these problems of perspectival and participatory ignorance. Because you're not just trying to get new premises, you're trying to become a new person, a rational person or a wise person. And when you're irrational or foolish, that is a, a significant transformation. So if aspiration is a part of rationality, but aspiration is not inferential, there must be a non-inferential domain to rationality that's proper. And then what comes out is exactly this aspirational project. I'll talk about it first abstractly. And then I'll give you a concrete instance of what I'm talking about. She talks about the fact that when, I, uh, when I'm when i aspiring, I have my current self, which is causing the future self, but I have to allow the future self, which isn't really fully developed, but I have to allow the future self to have a normative demand on me. It's this, it's, it's, right? It has to be able to challenge me beyond where I am. Mm-hmm. Now, let me give you a concrete example of that, because that might sound like this is weird. Human beings don't do this. OK, so this is the work of Hirschfeld and other people. You go in to a university where you get the best of the academics who are supposed to be the most rational and the responsive to argument and evidence. You give them compelling evidence and argument that they should start saving for their retirement right now. You let them make any objections. You, you do this until they all agree, I should start saving right now. You come back in six months to find that none of them have started saving reliably it's because of hyperbolic discount. Now you do the following. You get them to imagine their future self as a beloved family member that they love and have to take care of. Now you come back in six months and you have two findings. They've started saving. And secondly, and this is how it overlaps with the imaginal, the more they were able to vividly imagine that and enact that connection, the more they are saving. Yeah. Okay. And I and I think, and this is what I was proposing to you, that that imaginal relation between the current self and the future self that affords aspiration, which is essentially, which is essential, I should say, to being rational in this extended sense we're talking about. I think it maps very well onto your notion of the divine double. Well, okay. Well, um, so John, this is the second time you've given me a, a kind of a version of this. And so I, I have, um, I've sat with it and I like it a mm. lot. I want to mm. ask you some questions in turn, yeah. or I want to, I want to, I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to let the ancient worldview press push back just a little bit on the sure. on the modern I, one yep 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 so here's what i'm thinking um I, I mean i i i love this idea of the future self and the way in which the future self can secure 
or um, make a claim on the present self in ways that when we stay imminently uh, in the present with the present self and, and its capacities for um, uh, um, inferential reasoning, it can't, it can't yep. affect right. profound right. transformation. But, but one of the things that is curious to me, of course, about the ancient world, in, in the, in insofar as I'm going to generalize about these traditions of the divine double, is that the, the, the future self, this double to, to which we are aspiring, is not, of course, a yes, fictive yeah. or imaginative one. It's much more real yes, than we are. Yes, 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 and in yes. fact, I, they, they would never say, I, present self, am causing that future self. Yes, yes, It's I actually agree. the future self that's causing me. Right, right. Um, in some way, and uh, and so there's there. So I just want to I want to flag the the yep. the ontology and yeah. there's differences yeah. and the and the and the causality. And yeah. I also I, I I push back in part not just to just not just to be a to insist on historical difference, but I actually feel as if um, that that ancient account might match certain people's experiences of their quote unquote future self better than. Um, a modern psychological account, like, oh, imagine your future self. Yeah. Some people feel like their future self is actually very real yes. and is in touch with them yep. and guiding them. Yep. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to say, hold on, it was about, um, oh, uh, the imaginal. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, this is a huge topic and I, and, and it, oh, one, yeah. it, it's one yeah. way yeah. into your, yeah. your, your rover. <laughs> Work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <clears throat> well, we've talked about, about the fact that, that you know we, we have this shared vocabulary of the imaginal, which yep. I, in my case, comes out of um, Henri Corbin. Uh, yep. And yep. although there's also another genealogy of the term to back to Frederick Myers, a psychologist from the 19th century. But but let's just leave aside the questions of genealogy and and mm -hmm. and take up the con that concept of the imaginal. Um, as something that is not, um, it is not imaginative in the sense of, or, uh, or imaginary, in the sense of imaginary. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. It's not imaginary. It's a form of imagination that actually perceives yep. a reality. That's right. It's imagination okay. for the sake of perception. Yes. Yes. It's a form of perception and it is, um, involved perhaps in the creation of that which it's perceiving but it is also perceiving that thing yes that's right um and so what i'm really curious about is this is maybe even another form of rationality maybe we would want to include this under the under the broadest possible yes. category of rationality this is a, this is a genuine question i don't know the answer to this can we think about Im imaginal exercises where we are as a kind of rationality as a sort of yeah thinking yeah. with um a reality not yet entirely seen <laughs> um yeah. and, and and again it's all it's a seeing with that's subject to discipline and correction especially if you're doing it in conversation with others if your imaginal exercises yes. are yes. communal in some way uh, but there's, you know, and as you said, that can be synchronic. You and your friends can be doing a kind of imaginal reasoning. It can also be diachronic in the sense of I'm involved in a tradition that has done these sorts of imaginal exercises. Where are, where, how does that, how do the sages in that tradition handle this as a form of rationality? And, and are, what are the checks and balances on that? Two beautiful points. And so I'm going to ask you to keep track of both because i want to start with the okay. second because i okay. think it'll afford me a good answer to the first okay uh, or, or good response uh, not answer good response um so i definitely think there is a, a rationality of uh of the imaginal and i do think that is what ritual is this is a proposal and i've been working on this all this year um and i'm going to be actually teaching a course on relevance rationality and ritual and so I'm following the line of work. Uh, there's a great anthology called Thinking Through Ritual, double mm. playing on the sense of through, um, right? To the end of, but by <laughs> means of, um, yes. right? Right. Uh, and there's great work in there by Schil uh, 
Shilbrick and others. And then I'm talking about the seminal article by Jennings, I think it's 1982, Ritual Knowing, and then a really excellent book. Um, oh, I can't remember the title right now, by Williams and Boyd, where they take up Jennings and then um, they offer not not a they they offer a, a correction a, a, like a, an amendment uh, and then Shilbrecht takes it all up and so here's the here's the basic proposal uh, and if, i'll just quickly try to do the three step of the of the historical sure. argument um so jennings says there's a kind of knowing in ritual that is irreducible to drama or to myth or and to our other ways and so he he proposes that and you'll see, you'll see why I love this because of the relevance realization stuff. He says that what we're doing in ritual is we're engaging, I'll, I'll, if you'll allow me some of my language, we're engaging in a kind of serious play because what we're trying to do is find a fittedness to reality. And it could be to aspects of reality that we don't, we might not normally feel well fitted to, but we're trying to find a fittedness to that. And here's where the rationality comes in. There's a normativity to that, which is, how broadly and how deeply, both out into the world and into my psyche, does the skills and the states of mind and the traits of character exercised in the ritual transfer? This is called, this is the problem of transfer appropriate processing. Let, let me give you a really concrete example. I can get into a wickedly good flow, flow state within a video game, and mm -hmm. it tends not to transfer to my life. It does, it does, mm. I'm not saying that's the case for all video games. I'm talking for ones, that, you know, in fact, the WHO video game addiction, because what happens is people get into the flow state in the game and it can't transfer into their real life. And so they mm. get anti-flow in their life, which is depression. And then mm -hmm. the depression drives them into the game. And then the game drives the depression and you get this reciprocal narrowing in their lives. They get addiction, right? Um, that's how it works. But when I'm doing Tai Chi Chuan, I get into a flow state and I get reports from other people reliably that give me evidence that it is transferring broadly to many domains of my life. I'm exercising it right now and percolates through levels of my psyche. And in that sense, it's much more rational than what's going on in the video game. I'm not talking about aesthetics. I'm talking about the fact that it, what it does is it gives me ratio religio. It gives me this proper proportioning of my ability to connect to reality and enhances it educates it develops it okay that's jennings now the thing is williams and boyd said that's right but that's only one half because what there's the, there's one direction the ritual helps me fit the world but there's also they said but there's an also another way in which rituals are used by people rituals can be masterpieces that people try to fit themselves to as a way mm. of affording the transfer so I'm trying to get both of the dimensions you talked about. Both I, I'm I'm sort of projecting onto uh, the the imaginal space created in the ritual, but there's also oh no no I'm also being there's a demand uh, a calling placed upon me to transform myself into conformity to it, and so you're getting mm -hmm. both directions. And this is what Shilbrick is bringing in, and I think that notion, especially if we broaden rationality beyond the propositional and even beyond the procedural into the perspectival and the participatory, right? There is ritual rationality in that there are better and worse ways in which you can engage in imaginal serious play and you can evaluate them in terms of breadth, depth, and, uh, and then finally uh, efficacy, broadly, yeah. deeply, and your relevance realization, your ability to be wise in situations, you get a lot of cross-contextual power about that, both within the psyche and within the world. That's a that's mm -hmm. a proposal first. And so, before I continue my argument, how does that how does that sort of yes? No, I, I mean I'm fascinated to follow you on this because I'd never thought to connect ritual with this. So, um, so for, I don't want to slow you down. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, for me. Ritual is the rationality of the imaginal. That's the proposal I'm basically mm -hmm. making to you. Um, and that the Say it again, John. Ritual, ritual is, is the rationality, the rationality. Of, of the imaginal. Okay. I just want to write that down. Okay. Now I don't want to slow you down because I think you were you were you were going to uh, another place with that. 
Yeah, because I want to answer your first question. Um, yep. I do get it that, right? And so I'm not, I don't want to do a reductive thing. I want to do a bridging of horizons and Gadamers between the modern and, and the ancient. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I do think that they, they, uh, they experience their future self as more real. And uh, I, I do find that uh, a place where what I'm arguing for doesn't map. But perhaps I can move a little bit more towards it, which is to say that if both of these dimensions of the ritual are in place, there's a world disclosing aspect that puts a demand on you that's real, that is not just, that's real. Like, mm -hmm. you, like the think about how this works in therapy. You don't automatically leap to the person, but the possibility, right, of who you could be becomes more real to you as you first get aspects of the world disclosed to you that make that realizable for you. It affords. Uh, and so, well, I can't go all the way uh, because of the commitments I'm making to a current understanding of cognition. Um, I would say that maybe I can move halfway and say, yes, I think that it's not, if it's truly imaginal, the future self is not just in the future. The future self is in its moment of world disclosure right now that makes me take that for, that step forward. And mm -hmm. so that is the reality of the future self. But it is not fully realized uh, uh, for me, but there's nevertheless, there's some dimension of that has a purchase on me of disclosure of reality that can that is the home of my future self and is here right now calling me towards it. That's my attempt to meet you halfway. Okay, brilliant. Can I try? I'm going to try to put that um, or put that insight, that claim into dialogue with Corban, if I right. can. Right, right, <laughs> okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we've been talking about future and present self, future self. And I'll hold off on Corban for just a moment. From the perspective of the ancient materials, I think probably a, a better model would be to say, there is some double, some self that exists um, that transcends both your present and your future self. Yes. That is somehow yes. both secure, securing the selfhood of both the present and the future self, and also perhaps, and this depends on the, on the text tradition yes. figure, impelling the self forward from the present. To the future self okay so that maybe we're dealing with more than just two we're dealing with three now corban has a really interesting yeah. take on this because he's trying to marshal both the neoplatonic but especially the um the uh the per largely the kind of persian islamic persian tradition Sufi. persian Sufi. yeah 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 um and their heavy theorization of the angel yes, <laughs> towards yes, this yes. Yeah. um so, may, and, but he says this really interesting thing at one point. So, you know, usually you'd sort of think, oh, okay, the, if, if you're, if there's an angel, that would be that kind of double character, yes. right? That yes. sort yes. of like yep. secures you and guides yeah. you. Yeah. But he excellent. says, it, I can't remember what book it is, but he says, actually, he says, look, what I mean by angel is actually angel names the ecstatic transformation of a self into its next um proximate yes. self yes. right so in yes. that case the angel is angel is both somehow like up there but also what the angel really is is names the function of a being's ecstasy and transformation so he says you can activate the angelic function of your being and maybe you can activate the angelic function of other beings and so that felt to me like you, what you were saying Excellent, excellent. You can see I'm just bursting because I think that is so. <laughs> I think that that is so perceptive uh, and pertinent. Because I wanted to say that that one of the things that was lacking in what I had previously just said to you is it sounded like I was proposing just the horizontal narrative, but I'm also talking about world disclosure in the vertical, right, normative, right. And mm -hmm. so, and so one way in which the future self can and the and the future world can show up in the current self is by the, those kinds of ecstatic experiences where you experience uh, you experience yourself beyond yourself still within yourself which is part of the paradox 
of self-transcendence itself, like according to Strassen, right? And 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 so if you right, and if you add to that the idea that the relationship between the world and me is not one of mere representation, but co-instantiation, that the grammar, the fundamental grammar of intelligibility, this is a Neoplatonic claim, and the grammar of reality are they they co-participate they right they co-instantiate but not but they co-instantiate in a coupled coordinated manner then the vertical mm -hmm. and the horizontal are also resonating with each other it, right so you not only yes. it, the, the world the, the world is the future world is disclosing itself and presenting itself to me like phenomenologically allowing me to take a step forward but the 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 the, the future self if I, if you'll allow me um, is also appearing as the sacred self. It's also vertically representing yes. capacities of self-transcendence that are already in, in play and available to me right now, but nevertheless are, are are also still ongoing and unfolding. And I think I'm agreeing with you when I say that. Is that <laughs> right? Yeah. No. I mean, it, because because yes, one, I, one more point. Go because on. Corbin, yeah. Corbin, and this is what how I think he I, I think how he how I understand him in a way that's constant what you said, right? The imaginal is not just this way. The imaginal is also without which bridges between the sensible and, and the purely intelligible. It, it's right. that vertical dimension, right? It, it makes the sensible uh, more intelligible and it makes the purely intent, uh, purely intelligible more, more, more phenomenologically present. It's doing that dis mutual disclosure thing. That's and right. so that's what I mean about, uh, and for me, that's that's the that's the moment where you can't really distinguish between the present self and the future self when that resonance is starting to happen, all right? Because, I, I mean, because when you try, and this is, I think, the other side of L.A. Paul, when you try to talk about self-transcendence, this is Strassen's point, in a purely inferential propositional relation or even tense relation, temporal tense, you get into paradox because this is Strassen. If I just extrapolate from my current self, then there's no transcendence. It's just right. But if right. something other than me introduces the requisite novelty for self-transcendence, then it's other than me. And so I can have self or I can have transcendence, but I can never have self-transcendence. Now, Rick Rapetti and I are working out a response to that. But do you see how that's what I'm trying to get past? I'm trying to say there's a way in which the imaginal is trying to break out of that straight jacket. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the ways it's trying to do that is by asking us to think about the, so, so is it Strawson? Is that who? Yes, you Galen Strawson. Yeah. Stra yeah. Oh, Galen Strawson. Right. Okay. Um, Stra I don't know this argument, but I'm, I'm just trying to uh, re yeah. repeat it. Um, that the, that there's, it's either self or other, but yeah. this tradition has a, I think a richer spectrum yeah. of views about what constitutes self and exactly. other. So there's a, yeah, it's exactly. It, it, that argument only works if you see the self as a, moda, a, a monadic substance. But exactly. if you see the self as a dialogical dynamic, then yeah. the argument falls away. But that's exactly what I think you and I are trying to articulate here. And, and like right. I say, I can't get myself completely into that ancient worldview, but I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> manipulate and massage what I have at my disposal to get closer to it that's that's what i've been trying to excavate from the ancient materials is that that idea that the the double which is itself a name that constellates all these different yeah sort of local terms to to get at this is there is a there's a kind of i mean corban says it that like it's it's a dialogical relationship of self to self yes. in which the transformation of self to se of one self to another self to another self is what you could essentially call the angelic function exactly. of that exactly. being. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's just it's it's really thrilling, actually, John. To, to um, I mean, I'm just going to step back and say, you know, I noticed this stuff in the ancient materials. I tried to constellate it, make sense of it from within each of the traditions. Then I tried to step back from it. And and say, yeah. okay, what does this really mean? Uh, what 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 does what work can this reconstructed view do? Yeah. And I I turn to Corbin as a as a kind of ally, and uh, because he too is tracking this in a different archive. Yes. And 
and that's been he having him as a kind of fellow traveler and and and, and not just a fellow traveler his real guide has helped me but what's thrilling about this conversation with you is it's probably the most developed version of it's the most developed instance i've experienced of um someone in the present trying to think with this tradition yes um I get a, I've gotten a lot of emails since I wrote the book. I mean, not that many people have read this book, let's be honest, but the, <laughs> for, the, for the few, more the few numbers. More people should read this book. Read this well, book. More people should, no, I think this book <laughs> is really important because I think we are on the cusp. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I talk about this in the current series that I'm going to be releasing soon after Socrates. We are really, uh, what's happening in psychotherapy, what's happening in cognitive science, we're really about to ch deeply and profoundly challenge the monadic, monophasic mo monological self that's coming and this book is important about that because it so tells us it tells us with good historical argument and evidence that that cartesian model is not necessary it is a historically contingent phenomena it is not part of the inherent ontological structure and i think that is really important sorry for interrupting you but i wanted that i wanted to really emphasize the point no, you don't. No apologies necessary. You were praising my book. I'm very grateful <laughs> for it. But, 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 um, and so first of all, thank you, John. That's very, that's very gratifying to hear you say that about, about the book. Um, I, I have been surprised because I know how few number of copies the book has sold. I am aware of that. But on the other hand, I, it shocks me the number of people I've heard from and the number of people I have heard from who have written me because something in that ancient account resonates with yes. an experience they've had okay yes. now the experience they had may be closed in different language um and it may have a, diff a slightly different phenomenology that's perfectly appropriate all those ancient texts and traditions also had you know yeah. text they had uh, different textures to them but what's remarkable to me is it has given some people um a framework and a vocabulary for understanding profound encounters and transformations in their life. Yes. And um, what I think is exciting about what you're saying is, look, there's a way of almost taking that and scaling it and putting it into dialogue with a number of other fields that could provide not just a kind of um, uh, a framework or a mirror in which someone would say, and not to dis this is hugely important when someone says, ah, that happened to someone else that it, that mm -hmm. acknowledges my experience. I, I, I feel, I, I feel I can hold that experience differently, but what you're talking about is look, can we, can we acknowledge and, and, and move forward with this as a theory and a practice? Like, are there ways yes. this can be um, enacted? Um, and, and do you see what I mean? On the one hand, you, totally, a framework can totally. just, yeah. So, I, that's very thrilling to me. So I just want to say again, gr I'm 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 deeply grateful for you for to, for engaging the book uh, on that level, uh, um, and and it it promises a kind of rubber hitting the road, <laughs> <laughs> uh, something and like I like oh that's really interesting, um, because I've loved hearing from these folks, but it feels kind of uh, you know anecdotal and fairly limited, yeah. um, whereas I do feel like this structure. And it's not a structure I invented. It's not even a structure I discovered. Plenty of people have noticed it before. Yeah, yeah. But but it does tell us, I think, something deep about ourselves. Yes. Um, yeah. And I wish it were. A, I wish I, it's a it's a much deeper truth than some kind of watered down Descartes that we're all we you know we get through our water supply. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that nice pun, watered down water supply. That's very good. <laughs> I like that. That's excellent. <laughs> Charles, this is obviously just the beginning. Uh, we're going to invite you to come back uh, multiple times. Uh, we're, I'd we're love to. On ongoing uh, discussion. I, I think uh, just to not overburden the the, the viewers, uh, mm -hmm. we, draw it, we draw it to a close for uh, today, because we did sort of get to an end of uh, sort of an argumentative yeah. move, an argumentative yeah. theoretical move. But I always like to give my guests um, the final word. Um, it doesn't have to be summative or cumulative. It could just be, you know, provocative. But what what final sort of thing would you like to leave uh, with the viewers? Well, 
Well, one thing we didn't get to talk about, and this we, we have to talk about in the future conversation, John, is <laughs> what are we such that we can imaginatively inhabit a rover on Mars? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that, what are we exactly? Yeah, such yeah. That that, such that that works. I mean, if that, if those reports and your analysis along with your colleague is right as i suspect it is because i think it resonates with a lot of other reports that points to something in like some capacities yeah. that um we need to we need to integrate yeah. so i would just say the provocative thing is you know to just again like what are the capacities that that are sh are, are revealing themselves that are disclosing themselves and how can we responsibly and rigorously sit with sift those uh, capacities, those experiences, and then how can we think about reality and our place in it with those? That would be my invitation for another conversation. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank this you, been, John. It has been wonderful. Well, we, we, you and I are going to keep talking. We're going to keep working together. That goes Amen. now without saying yes. Amen.